This program is made possible by the members of the Church Street Baptist Church in Greensboro, North Carolina. Coming up this week on Unspeakable Joy with Pastor Tyler Galden. Calvary, where Jesus died. He's on a cross, nailed foot and hand, pierced in the side, crowned with thorns, blood dripping into the ground. But remember, He is the eternal Son of God. He is the everlasting Son of God. He is always has been and He always will be. And there never was not a time when He was not. Never was not a time when He was not. He he always been, always will be, always shall be, always can be, always going to be. He's always going to be there. However you want to put that. So therefore, the blood in Him tells a story it cries as the blood's flowing down Calvary and it hits the ground the blood of Abel you know what it's crying vengeance death payment due the blood of the second Abel The blood of the spotless Lamb of God is dripping on the ground. And the blood of that second Abel is not crying vengeance. That blood of that second Abel is not crying payment due. Do you know what the blood of that second Abel is crying? It's crying this paid in full victory, life, peace, mercy, grace. Save to rest like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart. To fear and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Genesis chapter 4. I talked about Abel a little bit this morning. I want you to uh, look in verse number 6. Now, we won't go back over and reread um, what we read this morning. and um, But I will start in verse number 6 of Genesis 4. Now, remember what's happened. Abel and Cain have been born, or Cain and Abel. They are the sons of Adam. They've been born. And the sons of Adam and Eve, they have offered unto God their sacrifice. Abel brought of the firstlings of the flock. Cain brought of the fruit of the ground, the tilling of the ground. If you remember, God respected that sacrifice of of Abel. That means he accepted it or the fire fell upon it. But unto the sacrifice of Cain, he did not accept that. Why? Why? Because what did Cain take that from? He took that from the ground. The Bible tells us that the ground is cursed with thorns and thistles. What did Cain try to do? He tried to take something fleshy. He tried to take something sinful and make it holy. And you cannot take sinful things and make them holy. There has to be a complete transformation. What did Leviticus say? The life of the flesh is in the Blood. God requires blood in order for salvation. That's why Abel's sacrifice was accepted. It was of the sea. It was of the the flesh. It was of the blood of the lamb. Now, in verse number six, we pick up the scene where Adam and, or excuse me, where Abel and Cain are together. They've had, they've come to the, evidently there was one altar in their little, in their little family, and they had both come. Verse number 6, the Bible says, And the Lord said unto Cain, 
Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And what that means right there is, is it means, Cain, you could have raised a sheep, you could have raised a flock, and if you did not know how, there were plenty of sheep in Abel's flock. There was plenty of blood that could be shed. You didn't have to do it your way. You could have done it my way. You just chose not to do it. Nobody will ever go to hell and say, Jesus did not offer me the gift of salvation. Every man, woman, boy, and girl, at some point, according to Romans chapter number 2, has been shown that there is a God in heaven. And if that person desires to, to know that God, God will make a way. That's another time for another place and another discussion. But let's look in verse number 7. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Verse number 8. And Cain talked with Abel his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. The Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. I am I my brother's keeper? And I want you to watch verse number 10. And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Abel, a type of Christ. I've talked to you about this. I've mentioned this to you. But you need to understand something about the Bible. The Bible is not God's manual for my life and your life. I've heard preachers say that that's not true. The Bible is not the road map of life. The Bible is a picture of Jesus Christ from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22. God is not as much interested in showing us Jesus or is interested in us being a certain way or having a certain amount of riches. I know prosperity preachers preach that. But God doesn't care nearly as much about me having $100 as me having the likeness of Jesus in my heart, soul, mind, and life. God is not interested in Tyler having a penthouse or a, or a pinto. God is interested in me being like the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, it's about one person, and that person is Jesus. Everything and every jot and every tittle, every T and every I, every iota, every Greek word, Aramaic word, and Hebrew word, it's all about Jesus, Yeshua Christ. It is all about Christ. From the beginning, when God moved upon the face of the deep, in the beginning there was nothing but God was, and He brought everything out of nothing, and He brought everything out of nothingness. And God brought it forth. That's a picture of Jesus. Everything is pointing us to Calvary. Everything in the Old Testament points us to one hill And everything in the New Testament points us back to one hill You'll find that God is always pointing at something In the Old Testament He's pointing forward to Jesus In the, Old, in the New Testament He's pointing backward to Jesus And in Revelation He's pointing up to Jesus Everything God does is pointing at Jesus Everything God is doing in your life and in my life I've heard this say, they heard this said, God is interested in making me a better person. No, God's interested in making me look like Jesus. If that means I've got to go through the valley, I'm going to go through the valley. If that means I've got to go through the fire, I've got to go through the fire. If that means I've got to live in poverty and destituteness, that means, I don't even know if that's a word, but poverty and destituteness, I've got to live in poverty and destituteness. If that means that I'm going to be more like Jesus Christ, I'm not interested in penthouses or pentos. I'm interested in being like Jesus. Now, that's not always the way it is. Sometimes I wake up and I say, God, make my life more comfortable, make my life better. I don't think that makes me a bad Christian. I think that just means I'm a sinner that needs a working of the Spirit of God in that sanctifying work. Here's what you and I have got to understand. It's not normal to want to be bad or to, to want to have bad things. It's normal to want to be comfortable. But God is not interested in our comfort. God is interested in our conformity to the Lord Jesus Christ. So everything in the old is pointing to Jesus on the hill. Everything in the new is pointing back to Jesus on the hill. And everything in Revelation is pointing out how Jesus is coming back to that hill to rule and reign for a thousand years and then for all of eternity. You've got to understand, everything is about Jesus. Everything is about Jesus. Everything 
is about Jesus. Every sunrise is about Jesus. Every moonrise, moonshine, moon up, moon down, whatever you want to call it, it's all about, you can't say moonshine this type of the country. Say amen right there. I'm telling you, everything, it's all about Jesus. The stars twinkling in the sky, they tell me about Jesus. The Mars and the Plutos and the Venuses and all of the planets, they're all about Jesus. The solar system, it's pointing me somehow to Jesus. I may not know how, but I'm telling you that it is everything in that Bible. It's pointing me to Jesus. Who's it pointing me to? It's all about Jesus. Everything's about Jesus. Every step, every jot, every tittle, every path, every walk, every way. It's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. So then therefore when I read my Bible, I should never read my Bible nor we should read our Bible to just find the way that we can be better. We need to find how that story, that person, that life, that ministry or whatever is showing me and pointing me to Jesus. Now tonight I've got one, two, three, seven points. I promise you I will preach at least one minute, but I won't preach longer than three minutes on each one. I I promise you that tonight. I'm just going to lay this out there. You can do with it what you decide to do with it. You may not do anything, but just get blessed on the inside like I got blessed. This message was really an accident. I didn't mean to study it. I was just talking about Abel and his supernatural faith. And I read an old commentary, and that old commentator said this. He said, have you ever looked at Abel as Jesus and as a type, as a picture, as a fort? Whenever I say that word type, don't get scared by that. It just means a picture. It just means it's trying to show you something. Ladies, have you ever laid down a magazine or a clue to your husband about what you wanted for Mother's Day, what you wanted for Christmas? What, bless God, y'all get what you want on Father's Day. I mean, you know, you just, you lay down. Oh, there's a lot of women in the room. Somebody say, man, I need some help from the fellas, you bunch of pansies. Help me now. You know I'm telling the truth. Here's what I'm saying. Now, my new word snowflake. I'm going to start calling everybody snowflakes. And here's what I'm it's just a joke, youngins. It's just a joke. I'm just playing. Anyways, my wife will drop clues. Sometimes they're subtle. and Sometimes it's as if she's talking to a deaf man. But everything she's doing is pointing me to something. That's what it is in the Bible. In the Old Testament, everything in the Old Testament is pointing me toward Jesus in the New Testament. Seven points, lay them down, do with them what you want. How is Abel a type of Christ? Number one, both Abel and Jesus were sons of breath. Both Jesus and Abel were sons of breath. Do you remember what I told you this morning about the name Abel? It comes from the Hebrew word Habel. And the word Habel, I told you, remember it had a twofold meaning? The first meaning was the word vapor. It were, was the word, it was the word puff. It was the word air. It has the idea of something that is breathed out and is gone quickly. But remember, I told you it had a double meaning. Remember, whenever Eve looked at Abel, she said, this is a nobody, and this is a nothing, and this is a pointless, meaningless life. But remember this, what man thinks is evil, God can turn it for good. And when the devil tries to use something in destruction, God can use that thing for a construct. I like that right there. What the devil tries to destruct, God will try to construct. And mark this down, when God gets to constructing in your life, the devil is going to try destructing in your life. So you need to watch out when the yellow signs go up that there's building and progress in your soul. The wrecking ball of hell is coming your way and he's going to try to tear it all apart. Now, whenever Eve looked at him, she said, this is a breath, a nothing. God had a different idea in mind. Do you know in the Old Testament what breath is a type of? Breath, wind, and moving air is always a type of the Spirit of God. Man looked at Abel and said, he's nothing. God looked at him and said, he is a breath from my mouth. Now watch this. Whenever man looked at Abel, you're useless. But when God looked at him, God looked at him and said, He is a breath. He is a wind. He is moving air. Watch this. New Testament. Luke chapter number 1. Inside of the womb of the Virgin Mary, there is a seed inside of her womb that is growing into a baby. It did not come from Joseph. Do you know where that seed came from? It came from the Holy Spirit of God, the 
breath of God. And when man looked at Jesus, they said, oh, he's nothing. He's just an old fatherless nobody. He's a purposeless nobody. But from heaven's point of view, honey, when God looked at him, great God in heaven, he said, he is a son of my breath. His father was the Holy Ghost of God. He's a son of the breath. Number two, something you find out about Abel and Jesus is they were both shepherds of sheep. You can look back in verse number two of chapter four, and the Bible says, and Abel was a keeper of the sheep. Do you know what that word keeper means? That word keeper means keeper. That word keeper means protector. That word keeper means garter inner. That word keeper means protector owner. That word keeper means somebody that births the sheep. Somebody that builds the sheep pen. Somebody that blesses the sheep. Somebody that makes sure that when the wolves come around, they've got a staff. And when the wolves come around, they've got a rod. Do you know what he is? He is a keeper, a protector, a watcher overer. He is somebody that loves the sheep as if they were born from his own womb. He's somebody that's willing to give his life for the sheep. He laid down his life before he would let a sheep die good glory in heaven. Here's what I'm telling you when Jesus rises up in John chapter number 10 do you know what he claims he didn't just say I am the good shepherd he said I am the chief shepherd I am the one shepherd I'm the true shepherd do you know what that means he's a keeper of the sheep you know what that means he's a protector of the flock you know what that means he's a watcher over of the people do you know what that means he's somebody that will not let the devil bother you and if the devil's hounding at your door that's because he's on the other side of the door of God I'm telling you this he'll protect his people. He'll watch over his people. He'll strengthen his people. He'll protect his people. He's a watcher over her because he's a shepherd of the sheep. Number three, they were both rejected by their elder brother. You remember, Abel brings of his flock on the other side of the altar is his brother Cain. And Cain looks at Abel, and this is what he says. There's no way you are doing it God's way. There's no way God is pleased with you. It can't be that way. Do you remember in the book of Luke, Jesus tells the story about three things, and they're all lost. He tells the story about a lost sheep. Tells a story about a lost uh, silver piece. And he tells the story about a lost son. And it's the prodigal son. Do you remember that prodigal went down yonder in the far country? And in the far country, he ruins his life. He ruins his inheritance. And when he arises, he goes back to the father. And the father receives him. But what does the elder brother do? Rejects him. The elder brother is a type of Israel, the nation. And it's showing that that elder brother, the one that thought they were the way to God, they reject, They looked at Jesus and this is what they said. There's no way that's what God wants. He's just a humble carpenter from Nazareth. Hear me now and hear me well. God's ways are not man's ways. God doesn't do things like me and you do things. God doesn't operate like me and you operate. God does things different. That's number three. Number four, it's a juicy one right here. Remember I told you I'd have to get through three to get to four, but I couldn't get to four until I got through three, but once I got to four, I probably wouldn't get to five. Here's four, and I probably will not get to five. Here's number four. What is the similarity between Abel and Jesus? There's a phrase. Here's the phrase. Their blood cries from the ground. Remember that phrase we read? Their blood, what verse is it in? Somebody tell me what verse it says. His blood cries from the ground. Verse 10. If you look at verse 10, it says, His blood crieth from the ground. Now, what does that mean? There's two lines of thinking on that. Number one, the first line of thinking And I don't know which one's which, but they're both pretty good. One line of thinking says that where Abel was killed, 
his wife and children, because he would have been married by this point, we believe, his wife and children are laying over his dead body and they're begging God for vengeance on Cain. And they're crying. They're crying. That's, a, that's kind of a literal view. That, that's a good view. But there's another view that's more of what I'd call the spiritual view. And I don't know which one's right, but they both got pretty much the same meaning. Here's what that second view. The second view is this. Do you remember what the Bible says? That the life of the flesh is in the blood. So the life of that man, as it goes out... Remember, and I don't understand all this. I can't say I, I understand. I'm just, I'm just telling you what's, what, what, I'm, what I'm reading in that Bible. The Bible says that those that are in Christ have everlasting life. So therefore, if the life of the flesh... Now, I don't understand. I'm just telling you. Just think this out with me. That as the blood of Abel went into the ground, it's crying up to God. Now, I don't know if blood, blood doesn't have a voice. I'm just, but what's it saying? Well, it's saying the same thing man has said through all of time and eternity. This is what he's saying. When will vengeance come for my wrong? Remember what the Bible says? Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Abel is crying for vengeance. Do you remember in the New Testament in the book of Revelation? That the blood of the martyrs in the tribulation are crying from the ground. Their blood is crying and saying, Lord, when will the blood of God's elect be repaid? So there on the spot where Abel's blood was spilled, there is an eternal cry that's crying, Vengeance! Payment! Death! Fast forward to Golgotha, Calvary, where Jesus died. He's on a cross, nailed foot and hand, pierced in the side, crowned with thorns, blood dripping into the ground. But remember, He is the eternal Son of God. He is the everlasting Son of God. Of God. He is always has been and he always will be. And there never was not a time when he was not. Never was not a time when he was not. He, he always been, always will be, always shall be, always can be, always going to be. He's always going to be there. However you want to put that. So therefore, the blood in him tells a story. It cries as the blood's flowing down Calvary. And it hits the ground. The blood of Abel. You know what it's crying? Vengeance. Death. Payment. Do. The blood of the second Abel. The blood of the spotless Lamb of God is dripping on the ground. And the blood of that second Abel is not crying vengeance. That blood of that second Abel is not crying payment due. Do you know what the blood of that second Abel is crying? It's crying this paid in full. Victory. Life. Peace. Mercy. Grace. Their blood cries from the ground. Now watch this. The blood, God in heaven, the blood on Abel's spot, it cries until when? Second Peter chapter 3 tells us that one day the earth shall be incinerated in a great fire at the end of the judgment. And what will happen? That blood will be purified. Now, fast forward to Calvary. If we take the same logic, right? If you take the same logic, the same fire that incinerates the place of Abel's blood crying, death, it's going to incinerate the same Calvary that cries life. What on earth are we ever going to do? Well... If the blood was only applied on earth, we would have no hope. 
But Hebrews chapter number 9, Hebrews chapter number 10, Hebrews chapter number 11, and Hebrews chapter number 12 tell us that everything in the earthly temple is a shadow of the heavenly temple. And here is what happened when Jesus died on Calvary's hill. I don't know how, I don't know when, but I do know this, that in some way, some shape, some form, some fashion, he took the blood that was stripped out of his veins and he put it in the holy coffin of eternal righteousness and he marched over the Milky Way he danced across the stars he landed in the third heaven they opened up those pearly gates you know what happened Gabriel and Michael were standing at the gates and they looked out and they saw the eternal spot good God in heaven and saw the eternal spotless Lamb of God and this is what they said open wide ye eternal gates who for the King of glory shall come in and Michael and Gabriel cried who is the king of glory and they said it is the Lord strong in battle and mighty in victory and they opened up those gates and he took that blood and you know what Jesus did he sprinkled it on the eternal mercy seat in heaven so when the the blood when the blood on earth stops crying life as long as as the blood is in the Father's presence, it will cry, life, life, life. And long after this earth is incinerated and infernoed, we'll be in the presence of God, and there will be the Son of God, there will be the Holy Ghost, there will be our friends and family that have died in Christ, and over to the left hand or the right hand, I don't know where it is, but there'll be a mercy seat, and it'll be dripping with the blood of the Lamb of God. I want to invite you to join us for 10 incredible days as we explore the land where our Lord lived, where He walked, where He ate, where He slept, where He bled and died and rose again. I want to invite you January the 22nd through January the 31st of 2019 to begin your year in the Holy Land. These 10 incredible days will change the way you read the Bible, will change the way you pray, and will change the way you look at the life of our Lord. We'll spend time around the Sea of Galilee. We'll spend time seeing the villages of Nazareth and Capernaum and Tiberias. We'll spend time down at the Dead Sea in the caves at Qumran. You can go and see the springs of An Gedi where, where King David fled from Saul. We'll make our way up to Jerusalem as we retrace the last steps and last week of our Lord from the pit at Caiaphas' house all the way to Calvary and the Garden Tomb. I want you, your spouse, your children, your pastor, or just some folks in your church to join myself and Evangelist Heath Williams walking where our Lord walked, seeing what our Lord saw, and beholding what our God has done. For more information, you can go to my website, tylergalden.com forward slash Israel. You can find the brochure, registration information, or register right there online for this trip. We would love to have you go. Begin your year in a way that will change the rest of your life. Explore with us the land of our Lord, the Holy Land.